week. Um, how did practicing your patience go last week? Uh, I really liked this acrostic poem that Parker sent in, um, spelling out patience. Thank you so much, Parker. It was so great. I love seeing your guys' work, so make sure to send it on in. Um, anything that you want to share from the lesson, a video, a song, a drawing, whatever it is, send it on in to midpoint at chicagochurch.org. Our memory verse is in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So today we're going to talk about kindness. And kindness is the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. You know, look at some of these quotes that I found on kindness says, do things for people not because of who they are or what they do in return, but because of who you are. Small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. Okay, so I want you to close your eyes real quick. I want you to imagine with me, okay? I want you to imagine a world where everyone was kind to each other where people used kind words and actions and treated each other with respect. Imagine people always saying the words, please and thank you. And that when we saw each other, we thought good things about each other and we gave each other really great compliments. All right, now open your eyes. That seems like a world that I would wanna live in. You know, and the great thing about that world is that with God, we get to be a part of transforming our worlds that way. You know, and when we all come together as a church and as God's family, and we can create that world in our church, that we can be people with each other that are showing kindness and love and respect to each other and doing kind acts to one another we can kind of create that world even in the church. And that's the beautiful thing. That's what I love about the church. So we can be kind because God is kind to us and God shows us the ultimate acts of kindness. So read this scripture with me in Titus 3, verse 3 through 5. And I'm reading it in the International Children's Bible version. It says, In the past, we were foolish people too. We did not obey, we were wrong, and we were slaves to many things our bodies wanted and enjoyed. We lived doing evil and being jealous. People hated us and we hated each other. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior was shown, he saved us because of his mercy, not because of good deeds we did to be right with him. It was God's kindness that led Jesus coming to earth and Jesus dying on the cross for us and saving us. It was his kindness and love shown to us even when we were not doing the right things. And there are times even now that we may not do the right things. God is always going to be kind and show us kindness. You know, we can follow God's example of kindness. We shouldn't only be kind to the people that are kind to us. We should be kind to everyone, even if sometimes they choose to be mean. We can be kind because God is kind and he shows us the right ways to live. You know, Jesus also was a great example of kindness. You know, when Jesus went to the cross, there were so many people that were being so mean to him. They were saying mean things. They were insulting him. They were treating him really badly. They were even saying lies about him. But you know what? Never once did Jesus let a mean word come out of his mouth. Instead, he let kind words come out of his mouth, even to the people that were being mean to him. He even actually asked that God forgive them, even when they were doing the wrong thing. Jesus showed incredible kindness to the people around him. And every person that Jesus ever came in contact, he treated them with kindness and love. 
You know, there are some hard things going on in the world right now. And so much of it is because instead of treating everyone with kindness, some people choose to be mean. And that is not the example that God and Jesus set for us. You know, I hope that when we grow in the fruits of the Spirit and we grow in our kindness, that we can be kind to every single person we come in contact with, even if they don't choose to be kind to us back. I hope that we can be people that always do the right thing because that's what God does. All right, so what are some practical ways that we can be kind this week? Well, it can be even little things like saying please and thank you. You know, do an act of service for someone in your house without being asked, like taking out the trash or clearing the dishes from the table. Uh, write an encouraging card to someone this week and send them lots of compliments. Let someone else take a turn first. Maybe when you're playing with your family or your friends, let them go first. Share. Share your things. Share your toys. Smile and say hello to people that you come in contact with. Maybe that's people in your neighborhood or, you know, when you go around places. Make sure you smile at people and say hello. You know, I also sent your parents, and I'll put it in the link, a kindness bingo. You know, that could be really fun to do this week, to see how many bingos you can get, or even if you can get a blackout board, and then you can send your bingo card back in and show us all the cool acts of kindness that you did this week. There are so many ways to be kind. Maybe you can write a picture of, that says be kind and put it in your room so that you can always remember to grow in your kindness. So right now, Miss Jean has some more songs for us. Um, she is showing us incredible kindness by filming these songs and encouraging us um, with, with her songs. So stand on up and let's get ready to worship God in song with Miss Jean. We love you. Good morning, boys and girls. You hear that train? I'm outside and I'm ready to sing some more songs for you this Sunday. Do it faster? Yeah! Okay! I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all hanging up with Jesus, I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all hanging up with God, I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all hanging up with Jesus, I'm all wrapped up, tied up, hanging up with God. Woo! Oh my God, girl! Let's slow down a little bit. Climb up the mountain. Point to the sun, notice the grasses, count every one, measure the rainbow, sail on the sea, God made the whole world lovely for me.
Hi, good morning, church. My name is Alex Montgomery. Uh, I'm a student here at the University of Illinois in Champaign. And so I attend the Champaign Church of Christ. Uh, and today I just wanted to share a few thoughts about communion. Um, and so we can turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. That's where we'll get started in verse 12. But yeah, this is the story of Jesus before Pilate. Um, this is right before he gets crucified. This is... Um, Pilate kind of has the say so in whether or not Jesus is crucified. And so um, let's look at what, what happens here in this story, just with um, all the factors going on. Um, starting in verse 12, it says, When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one, of, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and had handed him over to be crucified. Now I want you guys to put yourselves in Jesus' shoes for a second. Think about his entire ministry with his 12 disciples he would go from town to town spreading the good news spreading the word of god he would heal the sick the lame the blind he would be working tirelessly for others serving others all day long and sharing the gospel this was his ministry people in this crowd have probably heard stories of him maybe even seen some of the miracles that he's done. And the night before, he knew something was going to happen. And he prayed three times that God would take this cup from him. He prayed three times that he wouldn't have to be crucified, that he wouldn't have to go through all of this pain and suffering. But he did want one thing for us, and that was salvation. That's what made him move forward with this. And I think in this moment, looking out on the crowd of people, he saw humanity at its worst. He saw people actively lying about him, talking about what he did in the wrong manner, disrespecting his life, his ministry, his life's work. All of these things he saw happening in the crowd. And most of all, he saw humanity wanting to kill him. They wanted to destroy their only hope of salvation. They wanted to kill God. They wanted him dead. They even said, let his blood be on us and our children. Do whatever you need to do. Do whatever it takes so that we can kill Jesus. We want him dead. That's what humanity was feeling. That's what they wanted. And Jesus saw this firsthand. I think in this moment, Jesus made one of the greatest acts of love that he ever could have. Because in this moment, he could have seen humanity and lost all hope. He could have been completely justified in losing all hope in humanity in this moment. They wanted him dead. They wanted their only hope of salvation dead. And yet he made that decision that in spite of the people and their lack of knowledge, their ignorance of what was going on in the full picture, he said, despite how much they hate me. I'm still gonna die for humanity 
so that they can have a chance to have a relationship with God. That's so powerful. He, he took all of the control in the situation out of his hands. He didn't say a word in this scenario, in this story. He simply did the will of God so that we could have a chance to have a relationship with him. This is how much Jesus loves us. There is no greater love than this. The fact that Jesus died for us in spite of how much we hated him, even while we were sinners. So I think during this time of communion, we should just think about the impact of what that decision has done in our lives, how much hope we were able to gain from the point when Jesus saw no hope in humanity. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much just for um, loving us so much. Um, you've created all of us so uniquely and you love every single one of us. And um, I just thank you so much for your sacrifice for us, God. You've done so much for us in our lives. You, you've given us a chance at salvation, God. I pray that you can help us just to um, take that seriously. Help us to respect you more because of that. Help us just to, to latch on to your love and um, try to give out that love to others, God. You comfort us so that we can comfort others. I pray that um, you can help us and um, ingrain that in us. Give us opportunities to love others um, in the way that you loved us, God. Um, I thank you so much for your sacrifice. I pray for today. Uh, I love you, God, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
so far. I know we've been doing these virtual services. I know they're not quite the same as being all together in person, worshiping God together, but how awesome it is that we serve a God that no matter where we are, we can still worship Him, and His presence is still there. So I hope you've been having a great time of worship. Um, today, we are going to talk about unity. Last week, Ed talked about unity. Today we're going to preach on that. Over the next few weeks we're going to preach on it. And it's because with all that's going on in the world right now between the pandemic, between racial tensions, I feel our unity is being tested in a way that it hasn't been tested for quite some time. And you know, Jesus cares deeply about our unity. Before he went to the cross, he prayed. And he prayed for us that we may be unified. And it's not just so that our faith can be strengthened and we can do great spiritually. He prayed that we can be unified so that the world would know that God sent Jesus. And that God loves the world even as uh, much as he loves Jesus. And so there's so much at stake when it comes to our unity. And so that's why we're going to focus on it, particularly through these trying times. And that's why I want to encourage you, especially over the next few weeks, to, to be praying about it and to be fighting for the unity of the church. You know, when you look at Jesus' band of apostles, those 12 men, there were some things in there that you could look at and go, oh, that would test their unity. In um, Mark chapter 3, we read that in the list of the, the men that Jesus chose to be apostles, we have Matthew, 
who we know was a tax collector before he was uh, a disciple of Jesus. And then we also have Simon the Zealot. You know, Simon was a common name back then, kind of like Mike or John is today. And so the way they distinguished that Simon was, oh yeah, you know that Simon, he's the Zealot. Um, that was the distinguishing mark for him. And zealots were uh, a group of people, and we don't know exactly when they became an official movement, but a group of people that thought, we need to take action against the Roman Empire. Because at that time, the Roman Empire ruled over the Jewish people in Israel and Jerusalem. Matthew, the former tax collector, as a tax collector, he was on the complete, complete opposite end of the, the spectrum politically than Simon the Zealot. He actually worked with the Romans to, as a tax collector. And so you imagine these two in the same group, there could be some potential sparks. There could be some potential hostilities and, and uh, conflicts. And yet they were unified. And the thing that unified them was Jesus. Because when Jesus enters the picture, it changes things. Jesus has a way of shaking things up. Jesus has a way of changing lives. I know as so many of you can personally attest to that Jesus cha radically changed your life. Um, and, and you are now in a place that perhaps you never thought you would be. And so even if you're a guest who's just logging on and watching the service and trying to get a feel for what we're like as a church, I want you to understand that no matter what you're going through, when Jesus enters the picture, when you start trying to put his teachings into practice, when you start following Jesus, your life can radically change. People would look at a tax collector and a zealot and think those two could never get along. And yet Jesus makes it all possible. And so as we talk about unity, as we fight for our unity in the church, I want you to remember that our unity first and foremost, above anything else, is based on Jesus and his lordship. I think anything short of that just won't hold up. I mean, we live in the United States of America, but it doesn't always feel that united, does it? We talk about red states and blue states. We talk about the, the northern culture, southern culture, east, west, we talk about the different generations, Generation X and Y and Z and Millennials and Baby Boomers. We talk about the urban populations and their experiences versus the rural populations and their experiences. We talk about the working poor and the 1%. I mean, we find so many different things to cause division among us. But when Jesus enters the picture, things change and they ought to change. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. In Colossians chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You see, as disciples, we're supposed to set our hearts and minds on things above, not on earthly things. We, we're supposed to have a different way of seeing things and thinking about things and processing things emotionally. And when it, when it comes to our unity, I think this means that our unity starts with how we see things, how we process things. Where is our heart as we interact with one another? And while being a disciple has very real applications to what we set our heart and our minds upon, it has very real applications to what we don't set our hearts and minds upon as well, as we'll, we'll find out as we keep reading here in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, 
anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and you put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So as disciples, we try to be like Jesus, but this also means we have to put aside certain behaviors and practices and attitudes, ways of thinking. And he lists a number of those in this passage, but I just want to highlight a few of them that I think speak directly to unity. He says we put aside, we get rid of lust and greed. You know, lust and greed, those things are driven by selfish desires. And there's no way there's going to be unity when selfish desires are running the show. It says, as disciples, we put away the earthly things such as malice, which is an evil intention towards other people. I mean, that's the antithesis of unity. We put aside slander, which ruins relationships, which destroys trust. We put aside filthy language, which would involve curse words, but I think would also involve derogatory language. When we are baptized into Christ, we, we put those things off, we rid ourselves of them, and we put on Christ. And it says we are now renewed in knowledge of, uh, in the image of our Creator. And so I think, again, there's this aspect of our renewal comes in this knowledge in the way we're seeing things, that we're processing things, uh, our attitudes and postures on things. You know, the divisions that mattered in that culture. He lists this, Gentile or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. He says those divisions don't matter anymore. This passage, I think, it's not saying that when we're baptized, the things that make us unique are washed away. So, I mean, if you remember what Ed read uh, last week, he read a passage from Revelation where it's this vision of people from all nations, uh, from every tribe, from every language is around the throne of God. And so you can look at that. And it's implied there. Their culture, their ethnicity is still intact. So it's not like when we come into Christ, when we're baptized into Christ, those aspects of us are washed away. But those things now becoming a cause of division, that is washed away. In Christ, those things that cause divisions in society, and these earthly way of thinking, these worldly way of thinking, those are the things we get rid of. Those are the things that are no more. That in Christ, they're not a source of division. So what does this mean for us today as the church, as we are striving to maintain unity with one another? I think one way we can apply this is that when we see each other, although seeing each other is often through Zoom nowadays and whatnot, but as we see each other, as we interact with each other, talk with one another, that we don't do it primarily or first through the lens of ethnicity or race or, or income or size or uh, uh, age or, or whatever, that we first see each other, and this is disciples to disciples, first see each other through the lens of Christ. We see each other as, this is my brother, this is my sister in Christ. Now, again, hear me on this because I don't want to be misunderstood. I think as we talk with one another, certainly we will acknowledge and recognize each other's ethnicities and cultural backgrounds and perhaps income and age and things like that. And that's all well and good. Those things can never override seeing each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I've had the privilege to be able to go to different countries and meet disciples in other countries. Canada, Romania, Jamaica, the Philippines. And while being from different cultures and countries is certainly a topic of conversation with those disciples, um, it's more what's at the forefront is this excitement, this like, oh my goodness, here is someone who has the same faith, the same commitment to Jesus that I have. And that's such an exciting, unifying thing. That's more unifying than 
a, a shared interest or uh, a common experience that we've had. Our unity in Christ is the greatest kind of unity we can find. And so my encouragement to you, or to us, I should say, as the Midpoint Ministry Center, is that we avoid seeing each other through earthly uh, uh, ways, through our earthly nature. You know, when we see each other through our earthly nature when we think things like, well, you know, they're kind of in a... That disciple, they're in a different income bracket than me when we fill out our taxes. And so really, just how unified can we really be? Um, oh, oh, another worldly way of thinking about it is, yeah, that disciple, I mean, they're, they're, they come from a different culture. They're from a different ethnicity. So how much are we really going to be able to understand each How much are we really going to be able to draw close? Or, you know, that... That disciple, they were born in a different time. I mean, our points of reference for culture, for history, for politics, for entertainment, it's all completely different. We're from different generations here, so how much are we really going to get along? Those are all worldly ways of thinking that we need to rid ourselves of. You may have thought like that in the past, but now that we are in Christ, we put on the new self. We put off those things and we put on Christ, allowing ourselves to be renewed in knowledge, in the image of God. And so we seek to see each other first and foremost as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, another disciple may be from a different ethnicity. They may be from a different race. They may be from a, 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 a different generation. They may uh, be in a different income bracket, but you know what? We're not going to let those things cause divisions among us. In Christ, Christ changes everything. Jesus changes everything. So we, in those differences, we learn more about each other, we learn more about God, and they do not become a source of division. So as we look at unity over the next few weeks... Let's set our hearts and let's set our minds on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. See, for we have died, and our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, may we also appear with him in glory. Amen.